Mr. President, I ask unanimous consent to speak as if in morning business. Without objection. Mr. President, I often uh, try to come to this chamber and offer remarks without reading a text. But this text that I've prepared is of such a personal nature and so difficult to uh, give that I think I'm going to try to read it, Mr. President. I also want to note for the record that, you know, in this hyper-political season, sometimes we forget that we're just Americans. Senator Kennedy somehow knew I was going to give this speech. And I was just called to the cloakroom, the Republican cloakroom, to take a call from our colleague who struggles with a terrible illness. And he wished me well in this speech because we share a common bond when it comes to human loss and a passion for the issue of mental health. I also want to report, Mr. President, he sounded great. And I'm confident he'll be back. Mr. President, five weeks ago, excuse me, five years ago this week, it was actually five years ago on Monday, my wife Sharon and I received the worst news that any parent could receive when a police officer showed up at our door to inform us that our 21-year-old son, Garrett, had taken his life. That day and the days and weeks that followed were the most painful imaginable. But instrumental to Sharon and I being able to persevere through those weeks was the love and support we received from my colleagues here in the U.S. Senate. To note just a few, Mr. President, Senators Wyden, Reed, Stevens, Bennett, DeWine, and Chambliss traveled all the way to Pendleton, Oregon, a little town in northeastern Oregon, for Garrett's service. And when I returned to this chamber weeks later, Senators Kennedy and Biden, who had experienced the loss of family members in their lives, were just two of many who reached out to me with compassion and wise counsel. Senators Leahy and Santorum lit candles for us in their Catholic parish. Senator Lieberman remembered us in his synagogue. And many Protestant col colleagues included us in their prayer circles. Sharon and I were reminded again and again that human heartache has no political affiliation. Sharon and I were also blessed to receive the support and understanding of the people of Oregon. We were overwhelmed with cards, letters, and kind words, many from individuals who had lost a loved one battling depression or who had lost a loved one to suicide. Indeed, as a result of the publicity surrounding Garrett's death, Sharon and I had become the focus of an immense fraternity of sorrow. I had never been aware of or imagined the size of this silent and shapeless society. But the avalanche of letters confirmed what my studies later taught me. There are 30,000 suicides and as many as 600,000 attempts of suicide in America every year. Suicide is the third leading cause of death in the United States for those ages 15 to 24. It is the second leading cause of death among college students, with more than 1,000 taking their lives each year. I began to wonder what I, as a United States Senator, could do about this epidemic, which had claimed the life of my son. Six months after Garrett's death, our then colleague, Mike DeWine, provided me with an answer. He told me that the epidemic of youth suicides had been weighing on his mind as well, and that he had co-authored two pieces of legislation he hoped might make a positive difference. The first bill, authored with Senator Dodd, increased screening for children to detect those predisposed to depression and suicide. The second, written with Senator Reed of Rhode Island, 
provided funding necessary to improve suicide prevention programs on college campuses. I reviewed the two bills and felt more and more that I had found my cause to bring suicide's brutal toll and mental health subordinate stat status out of our society's shadows. I believe that the shame and the stigma our society feels about mental health must stop. And a national conversation needed to begin. I believe that if government policy and insurance priorities did not change, then more lives would be tragically lost, more families would be shattered, more of our citizens would wander our streets and needlessly fill our jails, and higher costs would be borne by taxpayers or be shifted to overburdened private policyholders. In short, our society would be diminished and too many of our fellow citizens would continue to suffer needlessly. Senators DeWine, Dodd, and Reed graciously offered to let me take the lead in advancing the legislation through Congress. And because of their support, the support of countless others in the House and Senate, and the support of the President of the United States, George W. Bush, we were able to make a difference. And for the first time, put the federal government on the front lines in the battle against youth suicide. For this week marks another anniversary, Mr. President. It was on September the 9th, 2004, on what would have been Garrett's 23rd birthday, when final passage was achieved on what my colleagues named the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act. So, Mr. President, I rise today during what is also National Suicide Prevention Week to reflect on what has been accomplished these past four years thanks to the provisions of the Garrett Lee Smith Act and to remind my colleagues of the work that still must be done. Since its enactment into law, the Garrett Lee Smith Act has provided funding for youth suicide prevention programs in 31 states seven Native American tribes or tribal organizations, and 55 colleges and universities. Incredibly, more than 150 people across our, 150,000 people across our nation have been trained in youth suicide prevention activities under the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Act. This includes more than 40,000 college students who can now look for the warning signs of depression in peers. More than 11,000 parents and foster parents who can spot the warning signs in their children. 9,000 teachers who can better identify the needs of their students. And 1,300 primary care providers who can better serve the mental health needs along with the physical needs of our children and youth they seek to heal. We also know that 13,000 youth have been screened for mental illness through the Garrett Lee Smith Memorial Grants. Of these youth, more than 2,800 2, were found to be at risk of suicide, and 95% were referred for mental health services. Amazingly, of these children, 90% received care. In my home state of Oregon alone, more than 900 people have been trained in suicide prevention activities. They have been taught these new skills in a way that will allow them to share what they have learned to train others.